Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to talk to you this morning briefly about the new age we are living in, the age of intelligent machines, and about the new center that uh, has been established very recently uh, at the Weizmann Institute of Science. And let me begin at the beginning, that the uh, beginning of the, uh, uh, the story of artificial intelligence started with this man. Uh, this is Alan Turing one of the founding fathers of computer science and one of the greatest scientists uh, in all time history. And it really happened in 1950 when Alan Turing published a paper um, in which the first sentence asked the question, can machines, machines think? And this was a bold question and his paper was really uh, a breakthrough and it galvanized the world. But remember this is 1950 where the hardly any computers working, so this is very early on in the history of computer science. So although people were really uh, galvanized by his ideas, the real work started slowly, and it took a few more years in order for the uh, artificial intelligence research to start in various places around the globe, not very many um, laboratories. One of them was indeed here at MIT, the Laboratory for uh, Artificial Intelligence. So the problems that people worked on turned out to be exceedingly difficult, uh, and progress was slow. Uh, and so 40 years passed without, any, without the world actually knowing the term artificial intelligence. It was kept only in these few centers around the globe that worked on it. But things changed in 1997 when, uh, as was already mentioned, this was a big surprise that the computer uh, programmed and manufactured, built in order to play chess, which is, you will admit, a highly intellectual and challenging uh, problem. Uh, so the computer managed to not only play chess, but to beat the world champion, uh, then Gary Kasparov, in fact, one of the greatest chess players in the history, uh, history of the game. So this made splash and the uh, uh, news headlights, and that's uh, headlines, and that's not surprising. Um, and what is important to know is that this required a tremendous amount of work. It took about 10 years to build this uh, uh, playing machine by a team of experts. Part of them were computer engineers and scientists, and part of them were chess uh, experts. And together, they teamed up for 10 years in order to create this uh, feat. At that time uh, of research, uh, Artificial intelligence was a very theoretical, purely theoretical endeavor, uh, and um, it, only people who really worked on this field knew what, what was going on. But following Kasparov and his initial successive, successes, even the, um, the more applied and commercial world started to take notice, and companies started to adopt this. Uh, one of the early adopters was Netflix in a probably limited application when they try to uh, recommend uh, what movies you're going to watch. Behind the hood, there was pretty sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. This is a small part of the algorithm they used, in fact, just to say, hey, I think you're going to like this movie. Uh, this is what it takes. Uh, but in fact, there was, it was quite smart behind it, because they had to build inside the computer some kind of a model of each one of their customers to predict his or her uh, future behavior and choices. The next big thing uh, happened uh, a little bit later, and here it is. Can you answer what this breakthrough was? And the answer is? Jeopardy. Right, so some people, Jeopardy. So Jeopardy is certainly for North American um, communities, they know all about it. It's probably the most popular uh, TV quiz game ever, uh, and the big moment was when a computer joined the competition at the contest and play head-to-head -head with uh, human experts, and in 1912, uh, uh, in 1911, uh, a system called Watson beat uh, in a fair contest the uh, uh, world experts, including one of them, uh, Ken Jennings, uh, who previously won 74 consecutive games in a row, but lost to Watson, and he said graciously in his uh, uh, concession speech, I welcome what he called our new computer overloads. So these overloads developed, and soon after, just a year later, 
came an event that in retrospect, or very quickly, turned out to be a real revolution. And the revolution came from a computer vision area, a competition called ImageNet. And ImageNet was a technical competition in which computers compete, competed in their ability to recognize objects in images, which is something people can do, but exceedingly, exceedingly difficult for computers. So the competition runs as follows that there are objects or images that contain a variety of different objects. It can be cars or people or flowers or elephants and so on. And then people who want to, scientists who want to um, uh, take part in this competition, get training images. They get images on which the computer should be able to recognize the objects. And then they are tested on about a million or more secret images that nobody sees before, but the, the uh, competitors are tested on their ability or the computer's ability to recognize these uh, objects. And the winner of the competition by a wide margin was a new technique a uh, new approach that was called deep network uh, that won very convincingly. And what proved to be a revolution was the fact that exactly the same algorithm without any major changes turned out to be highly useful or capable for do of doing almost anything, a very large variety of problems that was uh, put to it. And this changed thing. It ushered, for example, the age of self-driving cars. It turns out that the same algorithms can be used in order to control and, and, and drive cars. Um, and this is really a technology that is, con was considered science fiction even a couple of years before that, but now it certainly seems within reach and it will happen. Companies are working on it. And in fact, one of the leading companies doing this is Mobileye in Israel, uh, which was founded by Amnon Shashua, who is an ex-Weizmann uh, student of mine. Um, so, this created uh, uh, a new technology and a new revolution, and things kept pouring in. One of the most impre impressive ones was the one mentioned briefly by Daniel Zeifman. Let me mention uh, again that the special uh, thing about it, this was playing this game of Go. Here in the North America, it's not all that popular, but in the, uh, uh, in the Far East, Japan, China, Korea, it's the most popular intellectual game. And uh, a contest uh, was arranged between AlphaGo, which is a computer system, and one of the best uh, uh, go, game, uh, go game players in the world, Lee Sedol of Korea. Uh, and the results were really surprising. Nobody expected it, even within artificial intelligence circles, because the game is so complex. But AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol 4 to 1. And one remarkable thing to me was that when experts, uh, human experts, were interviewed after this game, they typically described the machine moves as brilliant and creative uh, and imaginative. And it's interesting, it makes you think, you know, if this machine uh, now becomes creative and imaginative, but that's the feeling that you get when you watch uh, the brilliant moves of the uh, AlphaGo that, um, that won the competition. But the creators of AlphaGo were not satisfied, and soon after, they created its successor, sort of uh, the, the daughter of AlphaGo, called AlphaZero. Uh, and AlphaZero was similar, but what it did is that it set its in own room, uh, so to speak, and didn't get any advice from any human being. It didn't even see any games played by humans, as opposed to AlphaGo that watched many games before it created its own, uh, its own move. So this AlphaZero just played against itself uh, quietly in the room, and it played at the same time. It learned chess, and it learned Go, and it learned some other games. And within four and a half hours of just sitting and playing uh, on its own, it reached the level of the world champion in, uh, in chess. So compare it to the IBM story that I mentioned before, uh, when it took 10 years and many engineers and explicitly programming what to do, here it's this machine sitting, just knowing the rules of the game, nothing more, and with mere four and a half hours, it reaches the top level that we know in uh, playing chess. So if you have such technology learning on its own, uh, clearly it can have many more applications in many other areas, and who knows where it will, uh, it will lead. So it started the... Uh, real storm of uh, uh, artificial intelligence 
applied to the real world. And you look at the numbers. The, in 217, the big AI companies, five or six of them, spend on AI research alone $30 billion in this year. Compare this with the total science budget of the United States, the federal uh, civilian science, which is 70 billion. So these are the two numbers, and you can see where AI is going in relation to entire, the entire uh, science research. Very recently, China um, joined the race very, uh, in, uh, very strongly, and they declared, and they have a program behind it to become the leaders in AI in the world by the uh, year 2030. It's not surprising that following this, the invest, investment of all of this money and big projects by all the leading companies, that we are starting to see more and more real life, uh, everyday applications which are around us and which we start to use all the time. And one of them, for example, is that we have now machines that we can talk to on our phones, or we can uh, ask them questions at home, uh, and are always uh, listening to us, ready to answer these questions. For example, the well-known Siri, always listening. Siri, are you listening to us? Hi, Shimon. Great presentation. Weizmann scientists are really smart. Thank you, Siri. Thank you. OK, she knows. So these are the uh, digital assistants that are becoming smarter and smarter all the time. Um, we have an increasing number and in really coming into existence systems that, for example, um, would be our friends and our robots, including robots that will help the elderly, uh, robots that will be in the household and doing much more than just sweeping the floor, uh, or robots that will, in fact, run complete factories on our own. Another area which is really taking off is healthcare. There are already systems in place helping doctors to diagnose and to treat diseases in a variety of diseases, doing it very well and managing healthcare. healthcare. And in many cases, it's starting to be superhuman in, uh, in its performance. Uh, another, I think, exciting area is automatic translation, which is already working, but it's becoming more, it will become more uh, online and ubiquitous everywhere. And just think that people can communicate freely without knowing uh, necessarily each other languages and what it will do to barriers across nations and across people who, dif who speak different uh, languages. So all of this is happening and taking place, but however, there is ho however, and there are limitations to artificial intelligence, and l let me point out a couple. One uh, is that almost everything that is done today with artificial intelligence needs huge amount of data. For example, Google has a very strong, very powerful computer system for recognizing faces, which is used for a variety of applications worldwide, but they train their system on images of 200 million, 200 million different images of faces annotated who is in which image in order to develop the, uh, uh, the system. And of course, as people, we just, as, even as infants, we look around and we start to recognize people. We certainly don't have to look at 200 million people in order to uh, develop face recognition abilities. Autonomous cars, which are working now very well, and as I said, they will enter our lives, they are trained all the time by millions and millions of videos of annotated images in which people annotate for them where are the roads and streets and traffic lights and so on. So this is the way the system works, and something is uh, surely missing uh, comparing them to human cognition and human uh, intelligence. And I think it's first fair, fair to say that in all of, this, all of this performance, these systems still do not really understand the world around them or the people moving and acting in the world around them. So there are both pros and cons, or uh, in, against this background, and which has these two sides, the wonderful advances, quick advances on the one hand, and the limitations and challenges on the other, the uh, Weizmann Institute decided to start this Center for Artificial Intelligence. And you may ask why the Weizmann, why the Weizmann should be able to, um, to do this. And there are a number of 
answers, and these icons represent the answers. First of all is doing basic science. So unlike the companies who mostly use already existing techniques in order to drive new, new technologies, uh, what we really need in order to understand intelligence better is more basic science, which the Weizmann will do. What is special about the Weizmann is also the ability to form close interactions. And in order to understand intelligence, the problem is inherently multi-field and multidisciplinary. Uh, so we need to bring together computer science, brain science, cognitive science, mathematics, working together in order to drive the field. And the Weizmann is very good at doing these collaborations. And in fact, I personally think that the next wave in artificial intelligence will come from putting together brain science, computer science, and uh, the other field to drive new ideas. And when we do this research, we do it for the sake of knowledge, not for the sake of revenues. But at the same time, uh, I think that the work done at the center will help also real application, the industry in Israel, to keep its competitive position and be a leader in, um, uh, in high-tech areas which are now becoming crucially uh, important. Uh, so that's what, why the Weizmann, and there are already scientists at the Weizmann doing research in fundamental area of artificial intelligence, including compo key components like perception, learning, and action, and let's hear very briefly from a number of Weizmann Institute professors working in this area. Let's start with some words on perception from Professor Michal Irani. You know, the world we live in is a dynamic world. Uh, things change all the time. And uh, we'd like an artificial seeing system to be able to analyze and perceive information and video data. Unfortunately, most of the success done today in the AI community has been limited to still imagery. Uh, face recognition, object recognition, but it hasn't really scaled up to analysis and perception of video data and dynamic worlds. At Weizmann, we've developed uh, unique capabilities for analyzing uh, video data by exploiting the, the redundancy within space-time visual information. That is to say, small space-time pieces of video data repeat themselves many times inside the same video, both within the same spatial-temporal scale as well as in other spatial-temporal scales. And by exploiting the power of these new uh, unique techniques together with the uh, power of deep learning, we believe we can bridge this gap and uh, make the next leap in dynamic visual analysis, something that the AI community is so much striving for. Thanks, Michal. And Professor Boaz Nadler at the uh, Institute is doing uh, sort of leading research in the crucial area of learning. So let's hear a little bit from Boaz. In the last 10 years, we've had a real revolution in AI and the ability of uh, machines to learn. Most of it, however, has been done in what we call a supervised way in which, let's say, uh, uh, computers were fed with a huge amount of images, but also annotated by humans themselves about what's in the images. However, that's not the only way to learn. A lot of learning is what we call unsupervised. For example, kids, most of the time, they just sense the environment. As an example, if I hold this pen and drop it, it indeed falls. And most kids, or even infants, know about this without having them being taught about gravity. A key challenge in advancing AI to the next level is to design algorithms and theory that harness this huge amount of unsupervised data, and this is one of the things that we plan to do over the next few years. Thanks, Boaz. And finally, Professor Tamar Flesch uh, is combining the fields of robotics and human brain research in order to understand how we plan and execute actions in the brain or in robots. Hi, Shimon. I think if we are going to talk about artificial intelligence, there is of course, need to talk about action because there's neither intelligent behavior in humans or biological system nor in robots without action. And therefore, in our laboratory, we study doing experiments, both high human moves. We measure movements in the laboratory. We analyze the movements. And then we model and develop uh, strategies and algorithms for the control of motion. We use this knowledge to train 
and to infer these ideas and to bring them to robotic systems. And we also study uh, control of motion in animals without bones, for example, the octopus, who is a very intelligent behave, uh, animal, to develop soft robotic system, which is one aspect of the future in robotics in heavy, having soft-bodied robots interacting with humans. Following all of these explosive advances and developments and looking into the future, I think, in summary, that a center for artificial intelligence will be good for the Weizmann in advancing basic research uh, in both human intelligence and machine intelligence and thinking about the next wave of artificial intelligence. It will be good for Israel to maintain its competitive uh, edge in high tech, in uh, areas that are becoming more and more important around us. And we hope that it will be good for the world at large uh, by advancing general knowledge and by making sure that AI remains uh, beneficial and, uh, and responsible. So this is basically it, and who knows, we hope maybe that some of the future great steps in the next wave of artificial intelligence will originate from the Whitestone Institute. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>